All right, so y'all know that I really like encounter design. It's something that I talk about a lot in my other level design study videos. But one thing I've realized is that there are these kind of recurring patterns, these sort of ABCs of encounter design that um, we never really get to see in isolation all that often. So what I've gone ahead and done here is I've created a map using uh, Trench Broom for Quake and um, basically created a bunch of different really basic sort of building blocks of combat encounters. Uh, I'm not going to talk about puzzle encounters and uh, things like that. It's just going to be focusing on combat. Uh, also, I think um, even though like I'm doing this in Quake, um, a lot of these patterns show up in Doom. They also show up in Half-Life. Uh, if I did a, a playthrough of uh, Fear, for example, uh, you would also see some of these patterns there. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of differences between all of these but um, the idea with this is to show kind of these common building blocks. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in. Yeah, so the first one is just really basic uh, hallway combat. Uh, if I step forward, I'm going to trigger some monsters to come at me, and uh, these are going to be melee-only monsters. <laughs> Cool. So already we've got a couple basic ideas. Uh, this sort of encounter isn't too exciting on its own. Um, it's it's kind of the thing that gets used as filler or sort of punctuation. Like if I've got a long stretch of, of traversing a space uh, from one arena to the next, sometimes you'll have these sorts of um, kind of filler enemies to break up the pacing and break up the monotony. Uh, make sure I'm still you know keeping on my toes and paying attention. Um, the problem with this kind of fight is that it tends to play out basically the same way each time. So if I do another restart here. Hey, so I actually got a hit in on me that time. Um, yeah, so one of the mechanics here, and this is one of those things that will vary from game to game, is we've got pain chance. So when I hit the enemies, they've got a chance of going into kind of a short stun animation or a longer stun animation, depending on um, randomness, and I think it's also based on damage threshold. So um, if I do that, then it can stagger them, and then they might block the enemies behind them, and that can slow their progression. But depending on that randomness, they might get closer, they might be able to land some hits like this. And really the only danger here uh, for me is that um, if I run out of space, they can corner me. And if that happens, then it turns into a pure DPS race, uh, which is to say uh, damage per second. Like, what is my damage output? What is their damage output? Who's going to win the kind of raw calculus of that? Who's going to win the race? So here we've got another example. This one is a more traditional DPS race, where this enemy's got a large chunk of health, um, and was able to push me all the way into the back. And as a result, um, I just had to count on my weapon being able to um, win the DPS race. And like if in the previous hallway I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't made it out with as much health and ammo as I did, then I might lose this kind of fight. Uh, so let me go ahead and restart and play that again. <laughs> And I'll go ahead and quick save uh, on each one of these. I meant to do that last time. All right. Um, so yeah, one thing that's interesting with the Hell Knight is that it's got two different attacks. Uh, it also has the pain chance. So you can see like if I get lucky with those pain chances, I can stall him and make it so that he won't be able to progress as far down the hall and won't be able to trap me. Um, but also if he does the ranged attack, um, depending on the randomness of how those different kind of uh, flaming darts come out, I might be able to uh, jump over them or dodge them. Or if I trigger a pain chance uh, during that kind of fan of knives attack, I can also interrupt that. Um, so the unfortunate thing with this is uh, this kind of hallway space where I don't have a lot of room to work with is um, relies a lot on the randomness 
Um, there is variety here, which is good, but um, if I win or lose this, it's not really based on how skillful I am beyond a certain threshold. It's more uh, how lucky did I get with the pain chances, uh, with attacks, things like that. So let's go ahead and reload the quick save. And I did build this where there's just enough room in the hallway. Um, this is, oh, what is this? 160, I think, um, because I think, oh, that's not right. What is this? Uh, so 128 would be four of these. This is a 92, I think, maybe a 96, I always forget. Um, but it's just enough room that uh, I can manipulate the AI's pathing. He's going to try and move towards me, uh, more or less in a beeline. Uh, there's a little bit of randomness side to side. But if I deliberately push myself up against one of the walls so that he's coming in against one of the walls, then if I get a pain chance that stuns him for a moment, I might be able to use the opportunity to swing around, get behind him, and I've bought myself a lot more space behind me um, to be able to back off and kind of reset the fight. If the hallway was any narrower than it is, um, like if we just did the two tiles here, which would be a 64 unit wide rather than the three, uh, then there wouldn't be the room to be able to do that, and it would be a pure DPS race. Uh, like it would, damage would be pretty much unavoidable, except for um, if I get lucky with the pain chances and such. Um, yeah, but even even with the space that's here, it's this isn't this isn't great. Um, especially like if you had this in like the halfway or three fourths point in your map, um, it's really hard to know how much health and ammo the player is going to have going into this, and that might be uh, really unfortunate. They may not be able to survive just based on preconditions. This may be an unwinnable fight, is what I'm saying. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to the next one, though. Yeah, so this is uh, your kind of classic hit scan combat. I've got some hit scan enemies at range. Um, I'm separated from them by a swimming pool in this case, but it's, it's kind of a skirmish line. And I've got some cover that I can use and some cover that they might be hiding around. And generally the idea here is that I want to minimize the number of them that can see and shoot at me at once. I want it so that only at most one of them can see me. Um, and that usually also means that I can only see one of them at a time. Basically I want to divide and conquer. Uh, and the cover here helps me to achieve that. Yeah, so I can uh, isolate the fight by using the cover, so I'm just fighting one of them at a time. If I'm fighting all three of them at the time, um, I don't have any AoE weapons at this point. I've just got the basic shotgun. I guess it's, it's kind of AoE, but the cluster's pretty tight. If I had a super shotgun, then I it might be beneficial to uh, try and get them to group up and hit uh, more than one of them simultaneously. But um, in this case, since I only have the basic shotgun, uh, it makes sense, and also at this range, it makes sense to separate them uh, and again do this kind of divide and conquer. And this pattern shows up all the time, so like um, uh, the Tim Wilts level E1, M2, um, the kind of second hallway, kind of the main hub space, you walk across the platform and you've got a bridge on the right, a bridge on the left, and both of them have a hit scan, uh, one of these grunts um, that uh, you have to deal with. In that case, it's like a platform to the right, a platform to the left, um, but uh, a very similar idea, and you've got similar kind of pillars to work around with. Uh, one other note here is that um, the function of the moat is kind of uh, what I've described in other videos as a, a leashing mechanic. It makes sure these enemies can't uh, push up too close to me. So I'm going to go ahead and load this up uh, with a quick save and um, show like another way of playing this. 
Yeah, so I've got that choice if I want to. Um, I can just jump across and fight up close. Um, I did take more damage as a result of it. It's not as safe of a way of playing. And if we want to, um, we could separate these islands further so that, um, or I guess farther, uh, so I wouldn't be able to just jump across. Uh, I would have to cross no man's land and take a, gre a greater risk in order to cross. So to show what that would look like. <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically a, um, I want the player to have this fight at range. I want them to play um, dodgeball, basically. Um, and crossing through the middle area should be somewhat dangerous. Uh, and that helps, um, helps with the pacing of the fight, I think. Yeah, I think that's probably enough examples on this one. On to the next. All right, so this is a similar idea, but with projectiles. Yeah, so uh, one way of thinking about games that I really like, uh, I think I first heard of this in Raf Koster's Theory of Fun, um, is that you can describe games as basically a hierarchy of smaller games. It's games within games, kind of all the way down. Um, and this kind of setup is, is dodgeball. Um, I've got projectiles, or in this case, a hit scan weapon. They've got hit uh, projectile weapons. I need to dodge them, they need to dodge me. Um, and this kind of setup, although very basic, is uh, really common in encounter design. And it's also, it's just fun. Um, it's, um, even though it's very simple, it poses an interesting challenge. So to be a little bit more specific about the challenge that it poses, um, even though it's three enemies of the same type, I have interesting choices. Uh, one option, based on the pain chance, uh, the enforcer enemies here stun very easily. Um, and if I stun them, that interrupts their firing attack or prevents them from firing. So one option is to, um, you know, if you're thinking, if you ignore the pain chance, and you're just thinking in raw DPS, if I'm fighting three enemies, that's uh, more DPS than if I'm fighting two enemies, right? So in that sense, I should prioritize just taking out one enemy and then take out the next enemy and then take out the other one. But because of the pain chance, sometimes it makes more sense to instead uh, kind of crowd control them and try and keep stun locking all of them so that um, even though it takes longer to kill a single enemy, it means I have fewer projectiles to worry about dodging. So let's uh, go ahead and do that one more time. Yeah, so you can see, based on those two different kind of opinions that you can have um, about how to play out this fight, uh, it creates an interesting tension. And also, because the pain chance isn't a guaranteed thing, because there is some randomness, I have to adapt. So again, even though this is a really basic little setup, this is a, a pretty fun little encounter. Okay. So that's kind of your standard melee arena fight. Um, it's pretty basic. It's all the same enemy type. Um, and we've got a pretty big kind of dance floor to work with. So uh, this is kind of similar to that first hallway fight where it's going to play out pretty similarly each time I load it up. Let's go ahead and do that. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, so I think uh, really the only danger here is that um, if I back myself into a corner um, and I let them surround me, then it will turn into a DPS race, and I might not be able to win that one because I've got so many enemies to worry about. Um, so instead, I'm just trying to make sure that I am making the most use of the space, uh, circle strafing around them, so that they always have, um, basically I'm, I'm kiting in the terms of uh, action RPGs, um, and generally I'm prioritizing the enemy in the front of the group, because if I trigger the pain chance on them, then that blocks the enemies behind them, which creates a longer path around, it basically slows the whole crowd down, if I can stun the enemy up front. Um, and also, you know, like if I'm trying to focus down a single enemy at a time, and I get the pain chance, the other enemies will tend to run in front of them and block my shot. So I kind of have to take out the whole group all at once, um, or like chip them all down individually until they're all weak. Um, this kind of setup doesn't really allow for single focusing individuals. Um, yeah, like it's, there's something interesting. Um, it's not very challenging. Uh, it's pretty easy to dance around this floor and avoid the enemies. Um, but like it's it's still fun. It's um, movement as defense, um, and it's it's satisfying. Okay, so now we've got another arena example, and this one is all with hit scanners. Um, individually, these aren't very hard to take down. Uh, let's go ahead and just play this one again. So you can see what I'm doing here. These guys are a little bit slower to move, and uh, unlike the knights, their attack and movement animations are separate. So when they stop to shoot, they aren't moving anymore. Um, and that means I can't kite them as effectively. Um, so what I do instead is I try and position myself in a way where they're all in a line so that uh, if they do shoot, they're going to hit each other. Um, and they're basically uh, meat shields for me. Um, that's not always easy to do. Um, if I do get a pain chance, then that's an opportunity to basically use that guy as a piece of cover to swing around uh, and know that he isn't going to shoot at me during that animation. Uh, but still, this kind of fight is uh, very attrition based. Um, like, it's very hard to avoid damage. Um, and again, like, similar to the DPS race hallway at the start, um, if I had one of these fights at the midpoint or kind of the final fight of a, of a map, um, I would need to make sure the player is stocked up on health and ammo. Otherwise, um, it could feel pretty unfair because. Um, and going into this fight, you're going to take damage, probably. Now let's go ahead and play it one more time. Yeah, so you can see I'm, I'm minimizing the number of enemies that can see me at a time. Um, sometimes it's easier than other times. Uh, and again, there's, there's variety here, so um, it does play a bit differently every time, but it's not, it's not very rich variety. And it doesn't really feel like I'm making tactical choices so much as um, you know, there's kind of an optimal way of playing it. Um, and I'm, I'm either playing it that way or I'm not. All right, so this was a mixed encounter where we've got the two uh, hit scan grunts and three of the knights. And this one is uh, a lot more interesting. Uh, we start gaining target priority because uh, does it make more sense for me to deal with the knights first uh, and like try and kite them in front of the ranged enemies? Or does it make more sense for me to push the grunts, probably taking some shotgun damage and get rid of them first so then I can more easily deal with the knights? Yeah, 
yeah, so each time I've played this has played out a bit differently. Uh, there are some real choices I can make with this. Even though it's it's a very simple room I'm in, very simple set of enemies. I've only got two enemy types, right? It's only five enemies total. But um, yeah, I can make interesting choices about what to prioritize, how to move around the space. Uh, it's becoming a lot more kind of spicy and flavorful uh, rather than um, these encounters that tend to play out the same way every single time. All right, so with this one, um, it's a little little trickier. So I've, I've added some cover, obviously. And what that does is it helps me to divide and conquer, uh, similar to what happened with the hit scan fight I had earlier. Um, I can use it to uh, try and prioritize one group over the other and basically isolate the fight. Um, what it also does, though, is it removes some of the dance floor I can use. Uh, even though the middle of the arena usually isn't where I'm moving, um, the enemies tend to cluster around it a bit more. And partly that's based on the shape of it. Uh, so I've got this kind of hook here, and the enemy might try and path towards me and be kind of stuck in this corner. Uh, and that means that if I do try and swing around the side of the space, I've now got a close range enemy to worry about. Whereas previously they would have just pushed up on me and then I would have had all this free space back here to work with. Like you can see, uh, compared to the previous two arenas, uh, I'm getting a lot closer to situations where I'm pushed into the corner where it gets really dangerous, right? These knights aren't scary so long as I can keep moving, but if I trap myself in a corner, they're really dangerous. And now that I've got this cover object in the middle, um, I, like I said, I don't have as much space to work with, so it's a lot easier to end up kind of pinned down and trapped. Uh, the other function here, though, is that um, it's some kind of hidden information. I don't know the state of what's behind this cover and pillar. I don't know that this uh, hit scan is going to peek out right now. Um, so it does, in one way, encourage me to move around so I can get that information. Um, but it also just makes the space kind of harder. Um, it's interesting because it makes it harder in some ways, easier in other ways. Uh, so it's it's a very different flavor. Um, but I think one of the main functions here is that this, even more than the previous example, uh, plays out with uh, a lot more variety than um, when it's just the open floor plan. <laughs> Whew, all right, that one was a close one. Um, so this is back to what I've described as uh, kind of leashing patterns, where I've got uh, these drop-down ledges uh, that the monsters the monsters aren't going to walk into the water because the gap is high enough. Um, and this is really common in uh, Quake, Doom, uh, I think maybe Half-Life a little bit. Uh, it's less common now uh, because um, modern games have uh, more robust kind of AI markup tools. Um, you could create this similar kind of uh, leashed AI behavior without having to modify the level geometry like this. Um, but the idea here is that I've got melee uh, pressure slowly coming around this platform, and that basically puts a timer on uh, my situation here. Meanwhile, I've got these ranged enemies that um, might be higher priority, but also have some cover to work with. So I can potentially use the cover focused on the melee enemies, or I can deliberately focus on these guys, jump across, and now the ranged enemies, rather the melee enemies that were about to reach me, have to go all the way back around, and I can uh, kind of use the space against them. So let's go ahead and play that one again. All 
Yeah, so I wouldn't say this one really offers as much variety. This one tends to play out um, pretty much the same way each time, but this one does offer greater challenge uh, and also um, kind of a, a harder choice for the player. It feels almost like um, you know, like I'm, I'm playing a board game and I've got a really discreet choice of doing A or B. Um, and I think that's that's interesting. Um, you know, when, I, when I've got the wide open dance floor and I can basically move anywhere, I've got this kind of analog choice of where I'm going, uh, how quickly, um, and as a result, the choice doesn't feel as meaningful. Um, versus here, it's like, okay, do I do I stay in fight? Do I jump across? Which group of enemies do I prioritize? Um, it feels more chunky. Um, again, I don't think of this in terms of like good and bad. It's more like this is a different flavor of encounter. And again, we just have two enemy types. Um, what is it? We've got five enemies still. Uh, same total floor plan, uh, just a different arena, creating very different kinds of encounters. All right, so here we've got another example. Um, I've got uh, this long walkway that uh, the melee en enemies are going to slowly pressure me from. It's kind of like I've got this timer counting down until I'm I'm out of space. Um, and meanwhile, I've got the projectile enemy that I'm playing dodgeball with. So it's um, kind of mixing and matching these two separate. Uh, you know, I'm playing keep away and dodgeball simultaneously, uh, and I have to evaluate. Is a higher priority again to deal with um, the enforcer, uh, make it so I don't have to worry about the projectiles, or higher priority for me to deal with um, with the melee enemies. <laughs> Yeah, so in this case, uh, by eliminating the enforcer quickly, the melee enemies no longer really provide that much of a threat because I can use all this water. Um, of course, in like a, a harder level, this might be lava, this might be like a death pit or something like that, um, and I wouldn't have the option to jump around. I would just have to um, deal with the melee enemies right in my face. Okay, so one thing I haven't really... Um, you know, obviously I've been teleporting from room to room, which means I don't have to worry about uh, like how the player enters the encounter, right? I haven't had to worry about uh, like the door problem of combat design, where it's um, how to stop me from fighting from the threshold into the combat encounter. By teleporting in, I'm, I'm kind of cheating, right? Uh, but with this one, um, and kind of the next series of encounters I've got set up, um, I've got a little button interaction that sets off the encounter. I can imagine that could slam a door shut behind me or, um, you know, like I'm already deep enough into the room that I'm probably going to commit to the encounter at that point. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and play this one. Uh, so first thing, uh, we spawn here facing this way and I've got the closed door. Uh, at this point, uh, with, with other encounters, you know, the closed door indicates like, hey, the exit's going to be on the other side of this. So I know what my goal is here. And I've got a button and I can infer buttons can open up the door. And that also lets out melee enemies and then triggers the ranged guy.
So yeah, I think uh, one of the ideas here is that I've got the kind of staggered spawn in, I've got the door opening, then the monsters come out, and then I've got the enforcer coming in later. Um, and that can kind of scramble my priority. Um, you know, if I see one group of monsters, I think, oh, I've, I know what to do, I've got the solves. And then a monster shows up that I didn't account for, and I've got to reevaluate my priority. Um, that can be kind of a, a fun challenge. Um, I think it's also like a nice way, I think one of the things, well, like with those earlier arena rooms I had where it's just a big flat dance floor, it's all the enemies at once, right? Like I know the entirety of the encounter at once and I kind of clear it up real fast. It's just very fast paced and I'm done. Um, and with this kind of thing, there's more of a story to it where it's, um, there's a start and end and there's uh, pacing. And I can kind of make it my own story by choosing how I want to prioritize different components of the fight. And if I wanted to, I could um, expand this even further, have um, you know, have another door open up, more reinforcements, and kind of escalate the fight over time. Uh, but again, the idea with this is um, kind of ABCs of encounters. And like this example is already starting to get into more complicated stuff. Like I've, I've got the leashed enemy that I'm playing dodgeball with, and I've got the um, the kind of catwalk space that I'm dealing with melee enemies from. Um, but already we can see how, um, or hopefully you can see, how these things combine to create greater complexity, greater challenge, um, and also a, a lot of variety and flavor. All right, so this next one's, uh, this next one's a little bit tough. So let's go ahead and play that one one more time. So the interesting thing here is that um, the highest priority in terms of threat is going to be the Shambler, right? Like that lightning attack is really nasty. But because I've got cover, I can, for the most part, avoid it. Um, so I can let him just be and focus on uh, the other enemies that are creating this pressure and narrowing down. I mean, these enemies are going to push me out of this cover, right? Uh, the Shambler becomes more threatening thanks to the melee enemies. Um, but one thing I do here, uh, like I was talking about with the last encounter, of like how you can escalate an encounter, is that after I kill two of these three melee enemies, I trigger a monster jump so that the Shambler jumps across and is now, is now able to apply more pressure and uh, push me out of uh, these covers. Yeah, so that ends up kind of telling a story to the player of this escalation. Uh, and I think, again, um, I'm probably repeating myself on this one, but part of the reason for having the door open and then those enemies behind it trigger and then the Shambler teleport in is I want the players to have their attention drawn over here. So that the Shambler comes as a surprise and um, so that they have to reevaluate their target priority. If the Shambler came in first and then these guys came in, uh, the player would probably already have a couple shots in and be focusing on the Shambler and think, I've got time to deal with that before these guys show up. Um, so by staggering 
when they arrive into the encounter space, um, I'm kind of softly nudging the player, like, hey, you're supposed to play it this way. Uh, partly, also what's going on here is that uh, the Shambler with um, Vanilla Id1, um, you can kind of bait its melee attack if you get within melee range, and that lets you do kind of the ultimate underworld dance of like step into melee range, back out, it swipes, it only hits air. You step back in, trigger its melee attack again, step back out. Uh, so having a Shambler at range where you can't safely approach it and can't safely do the ultimate underworld dance um, makes it a lot more threatening than, um, you know, like if I had the same space, which is all flat floor, uh, the Shambler would be a big threat. Um, but if I let the Shambler stay on that platform after I dealt with melee enemies, then I could just fight from cover, which isn't really that exciting either, right? Like I would just... All right, let's go ahead and load it up and try again. Yeah, so one of the other ideas I liked about this space is that um, this platform over here um, can become useful as a traversal option once the Shambler is, once he's jumped across. Uh, you can use it to complete the loop. Um, and you know, if, if the Shambler is at point blank here, I can't really use this, uh, this pillar as cover against him because I would end up in the water. Uh, but I can jump across and try and use it like that. And also that means that the Shambler is going to try and close that melee distance again, and I've bought myself time. Okay. So that's a bit of a, a de-escalation from that uh, the Shambler fight. I guess uh, one more thought on the Shambler fight before, before I move on to this one is that, um, again, that fight, there's kind of a right way to play it. Um, if you prioritize the wrong way, like I did in that last attempt, uh, it gets really hard, right? Um, so I think like the trade-off there is that it's it's much higher challenge than just like a flat open arena space or an arena with some pillars and a shambler. Um, so there is this trade-off of challenge for variety, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but okay, let's go ahead and move on with this space. Um, so what's going on here is that the player doesn't have a lot of space to work with. They've just got this uh, the starting platform, and they're dealing with uh, the wizards, which don't have to worry about crossing the ground. They can just fly wherever they want. Uh, and that means that um, I've got very few options in terms of my positioning. Uh, they've got a lot of options. And um, if I... Basically, they're playing um, the keep away game that the knights were playing uh, on the big open flat arena. Uh, but I'm stuck playing the dodgeball game, right? Um, so this kind of encounter shows up uh, all the time in Quake uh, with the wizards. It also shows up a whole lot in Doom with the Kako demons, where uh, the player will be trapped on kind of a narrow platform, maybe with some cover, maybe not, uh, and they'll have ranged enemies that um, are able to fly and apply pressure in ways that the player can't easily counter. Um, yeah, so this is kind of just another flavor, uh, another tool in the toolbox, um, one of the ABCs, I guess. I don't know if we're on uh, E, F, G at this point, but uh, yeah, it's one of the tools in the toolbox. Yeah, so this one is kind of another way of creating that same, um, that same sort of pattern, um, but using other enemies. So this shows up all the time in Plutonia, um, where there are slime floors or blood floors or other kind of damaging floors. Um, 
and the enemies don't care. Enemies, um, like these knights, will still run towards me and apply pressure because the floor is not deep enough for them to think that it's uh, a drop-down ledge. Uh, but if I try and use those spaces, I take damage for it. Um, so again, this is uh, kind of another way of creating increased challenge. It reduces the amount of options the player has, but it can also make those options uh, chunkier, right? Um, so like if I had uh, jump platforms around here, um, then it starts to feel a bit more like board game-like of uh, big chunky choices, rather than, again, the, the flat arena where I've got the more analog, go anywhere, do anything kind of feeling to it. Yeah, so I think um, you know, there are a lot of options that you can do with this kind of space. If I was fighting a Shambler, um, then it might make sense for me to pay the cost of walking through the slime to avoid its damage, because the slime's going to do less damage to me than you know, a direct lightning blast or a direct melee attack from the Shambler. Um, so you can use this kind of thing to create some really nasty, <laughs> really challenging kind of spaces. Um, but again, uh, as we kind of up the challenge of some of these different patterns, um, it does make damage harder to avoid. Like if I went into this space with only one health, uh, I'd probably lose, right? Like this is, um, it's really hard to play this without taking any damage. Um, yeah, I think that might be the last one I've got in the series here. Uh, let me just go ahead and jump across and see. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the uh, last one of the set. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's kind of the ABCs of uh, basic encounters. Um, let's go ahead and just no clip around and, and take a look. Yeah, so we started with uh, some basic hallways. Um, and how that turns into DPS races if you aren't careful, uh, then some basic arenas, um, and how that can uh, inform target priority, um, kiting, and um, kind of grouping enemies with hit scanners. I um, also talked about the uh, kind of the leashed platforms and how that behaves as uh, kill zones or skirmish lines and turns the space kind of into a dodgeball space. Uh, and then we got into some more complex patterns where uh, melee enemies are able to close the distance um, through these long catwalks, but uh, ranged enemies are leashed back where they're going to um, be more threatening. So it's a combination of the keep away and dodgeball, and the player has to, has to make some choices about which is the higher threat, which one do they deal with first. And then we had a couple different encounters, stitching those all together into some more challenging rooms. Uh, and then last one was um, these two rooms where uh, enemies had more maneuverability options in the arena than the player did, and how that can create challenge. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's it uh, for the stuff I wanted to go through. I do have one other room here that I think might be a fun thing to end on. <coughs> So let's go ahead and save because this one's hard. All right.
All right, I think that's going to do it for this video. Um, hopefully that was uh, a useful tour through uh, some basic patterns of um, combat encounter design with classic FPSs. Um, yeah, I guess if there, if there are other patterns that I haven't covered, um, I, I'm sure there are things I didn't cover, and I'm sure there's like more explanation that uh, I could have gone into on some of these things. But um, yeah, if there's anything um, that seems really important that I missed, uh, let me know. Um, and I might do a follow-up video at this, uh, on this at some point. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that was useful.